crushing and adding. And once they had this all mashed up, they bought form this into a ball. They would then call this substance here nutty balls when they would form this into a ball <coughs> and drink it just as it was. Or sometimes you get corn. Get the corn off the cob, put them in the boiling water. Come on this food for months at a time, not losing their body nutrients. And that's you. In the six-week corn, which is like the, your earliest corn they could have, your popcorn, or the six-week corn resembled popcorn. And your basic flower corn took all summer to grow your popcorn corn. The wild plants you see here is poke solid. Back then they go out and collect it when it's just a young sapling. It's much tender back then. You boil that, throw the soup away, you eat the greens. And this was the sort of type of food they had back then. made from a ball, and it's stone that big, animal hair covered in stone, didn't have your animal hide covered. The fish, they got four points. The first thing at 12 points would win the game, but they had to go through rituals for them to play the game. One was physical training, fasting, a scratch and ripple, seven tooth bone comb. This bone comb was used to scratch their bodies with that. Themselves, drawing blood. When in battle, you won't be, draw, you won't be the first person to draw blood. Then for the final effect, they went to the water for a water ritual. Now they're ready to play the game, but the game is very physical because there's no set rules or referees to break up the pile that they're going to have. Nine times out of ten, they will pile up in one area of the field. What they're trying to do is keep the ball moving at all times. The finger the head. And this way they got bruises, concussions, sometimes even broken limbs for playing the game. Very physical. What this game did for them back then, it worked on their physical strength, their stamina, their agility, and the mental toughness. This is preparing for the actual combat in the future. They should go to war next week, they're prepared. This is blow guns. The Cherokees go to the river and collect their pain. Bring back to the village. Strip off the limbs and stuff. Dry them out. When they dry, they might come out a little crooked, a little bold. They gotta get the cooking and stuff. They get a big fire going. That's just a big fire there, okay? Place the pan above the flame. Start to start rolling this manner here. When this became real pliable, got really hot. Quickly became. Attention. Our craftsman here is Bill. He makes his blow gun. He's going to blow dark to the village. The one method they had was by getting a long, thick, sharp point. <laughs> they insert one in there and start pouring out the hole. But, what's the distance of that passage? Okay, this type of wood they would have back then. Bow dart, yellow locust, hedge apple, whatever you want to call it. It's that. Strip off a section from their limb there, get their stone. This was their tool back then, it's flint rock. They proceeded to start shaving it. Like the blow dart you see out there, a point like that by just making the design. Back then they had names and meanings for these, but they've been lost for years. Once they get caught, they're almost done. Now they roll the pots to the fire until the fire went out. This was to get their light and dark textures. For a light texture, they burn hickory and oak. Does more burning than smoke. For a dark texture, they burn cedar and pine, which just does the opposite of smoke. Hot brush. They don't have bug brush out here. So this spot's this big here, the vines, 
black walnut bark. They had a yellow from yellow root, orange from blood root, and a black from butternut tree. This was their color. Get the root or bark place in boiling water. Let the soft or food look like to have died. The person just came in by trade. Now they were put in all the water of the bathroom. And that's what Bobby's doing now. And he's uh, working on the edges of the arrowhead by chipping off. Make large ones. This is done for your like cultivating a garden. These big ones here. Can I show you what I'm doing? I thought this fish in place. It's broken. They have them on this side here where they, once they get, dig the fish, this thing held it in place so they would slide off. These aren't really tied down that well. I mean, medical penetration. See the human being syndrome? The rib cage runs sideways. So like the rib cage is good. You want to keep the tip from going to force it through, though. Not really side. Pull out the tip and then pull it back out because this is going to come out inside the body. Probably not coming it down real great. They shot a squirrel on a high tree that missed the squirrel. This is the tree. It's a various types of weaponry. Various colors. The Cherokees, when in battle, would paint their weaponry red, symbolizing blood and war. They put a flag in the village, too, stating they were in wartime. These from berries, they paint their faces red in black circles. Some even shave their heads off, leaving a little patch of hair on the side of the head. They go to the edges of the battle line and mock the enemy by waving to this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good day. That was fair. This is our ceremonial swear ground. To the Cherokees, they never dance for pleasure, but each dance would have a purpose behind it. They'll dance on a ground like this, with the size being determined by how large the villages were. And they'll use the woodland turpin rattle. And right behind the lead dancer, they would have a woman wearing seven terrapin shells on each of her legs, and she would shake the shells as they danced. These were never used for anything else. Mm -hmm. The only times that they used feathers was the eagle dance, and only those in a higher social position, like a chief or a medicine man or a council member, could wear the eagle feathers. Anna's using the stainless steel needle, the flax thread, and the commercial glass beads. Thread made from a deer sinew or fibers from an Indian hemp plant. They'll make their needles by carving the straight bone from a deer's leg. Came lost, and today we no longer know the designs. And they'll just put designs that has meaning to the person that does them today. Anna's using the stainless steel needle, the flax thread, and the commercial glass beads. Thread made from a deer sinew or fibers from an Indian hemp plant. They'll make their needles by carving the straight bone from a deer's leg. Came lost, and today we no longer know the designs. And they'll just put designs that has meaning to the person that does them today. The pole. There will be a large chunk of meat there on the uh, pole resting on the rock. When the, gra when the bear grabbed it, it would uh, come down on top of it. It's a lot larger, too.
To the amazement of European witnesses, Cherokee women participated freely in political events, and some even shared the hardship and glory of battle. Traditionally, the dwellings and farmland were possessed by the women, with their rights strictly enforced by the clans. Marriage was by mutual consent, and the ceremonial arrangements were made by the clans. Where the executive branch of tribal government was consolidated with the first organized election by council of a principal chief and assistant chief. In 1797, with the help of the federal government, the Light Horse or National Police Force brought clarity to the territory to go around the country. This should be placed overnight. Because the new officials were powerful, and this is a very early fire. It was our understanding of the English perpetrator. And this is a constitution of the government of the white people's government. You say you are writing about the Cherokee. I'm delighted to meet you. <laughs> I hope you won't mind if I ask you a thousand questions. Why, Benjamin tells me you know more about the Cherokee than anyone else. I love to talk about the Cherokee. <laughs> Where shall we start? Let's see. Let's go back 66 years to 18 and Cherokee. The government selected this land west of the Mississippi promising that no state would ever be formed here. Where the Indians could find peace and happiness. They called it Indian Territory. So, in the 1830s, the army moved thousands of Indian people to the West, guaranteeing to pay them for their land back. Why do I mention this mythical creature of our imagination? Because, as you will see, the Cherokee had a death wish. We were somehow destined to destroy our own nation. So now, you must forgive me for such a long speech. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> the year is 1839. The main body of the Cherokee people swung through spring rains, mud and sleet, on the tragic trail of tears. Here, in the vicinity of Tahlequah, the Western band waits anxiously, nervously, for the ragged army of newcomers, almost strangers, after four long... As each contingent arrived, the first thing was to draw rations. The government had made a contract with the firm of Glasgow and Harrison, who set up several stations, one of which was along the Illinois River in... Work to be done! Now, just a moment! The Western Cherokee have an established government of their own. Now, our chiefs called this council in order to welcome our brothers from the east. Well, that position will, of course, be occupied by the principal chief, John Brown. Well, I mean, by assistant chiefs, Rogers and Looney. There's only one principal chief, and his name is John Ross. Yeah. John Brown, come forward and challenge him. Yeah. I tell you, John Brown, come forward and challenge the right of John Ross. Yeah. Sit by our campfire. Bring peace to the Cherokee. I got it. I knew that the car had to do it. Now listen, this is why you don't like them. That's one of the things. Cherokee, hear me, brother. Some of us moved here five, ten, twenty
Cherokee stood on top of the world, almost touching the heavens. From the peaks of our mist-shrouded mountains, we are a proud nation. Both of us, 
Uncle yeah, Stan, this is my husband. Your own nephew. Let's go. All right. Oh, Seen in my life. 